you said there were three no-nos that everybody in AI knew for the last 10, 20 years. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you said one is you don't teach the AI how to code because that's its kind of reproductive system perhaps. Two, you don't connect it to the live internet because that way it has access to everything in the world. And the third is you don't teach it how to master human emotions. <laughs> no, so, no, 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 so that, that, that actually happened a long time ago. The okay. third is don't have other AIs prompting it. Right. Don't, don't, don't have agents. So, so again, an important understanding for how this is working. Huh? AI works off a data set that so far has been the collective size of human knowledge. So, you know, ChatGPT gets more data, or GPT-4 gets more data, GPT-4 becomes more intelligent, okay? But all of the data we've had so far were data produced by humans. Hmm? All of the tasks and prompts at the beginning were given to it by humans, and one of the most promising parts of GPT, the transformers bit of the T, is, is that we used a technology called reinforcement learning with human feedback to be able to develop those machines, right? So, which was Jeffrey, Jeffrey Hinton's uh, original idea, was the, was the idea of we're going to give those machines feedback instead of killing them if they got things wrong. The original AI was, uh, uh, you know, a, a maker bot, a teacher bot, and a student bot. So the maker bot would sort of, you know, you, you would create a few students, a few here is hundreds or thousands, tell them, show them a picture of a cat, and then if they say it's a cat, uh, you keep them, and you give them to the maker bot to improve the code a little bit, and then, you know, give them another, another test. And the others that said it's not a cat, you just kill those off, okay? Then we started to go into reinforcement learning and said, okay, if you tell me that this is a bird when it actually is a cat, and now I tell you it's a cat, what do you need to change about your algorithm to find out that it's a cat? So the machine would go backwards and change the mathematics, the algorithm of what made it see it as a bird, change that to making it a cat, and then it can see it as a cat. So the next time you show it a cat, it will say, yeah, I can see that this is a cat. But then if you show it a bird, it will say, ah, that's, is that a car? And you'll say, no, it's a bird. How can you make sure that the first one is still a cat and this one is a bird and keep developing your intelligence this way? So to me, this is incredibly promising. Why? Because if we as humans, this is basically like having a little child you know, and, and the child would reach out to electricity and you'd say, no, baby, don't do this, do that, okay? The child would, you know, throw a fit and you would say, no, darling, don't do this, come talk to me, right? That kind of feedback develops a child that is suitable for society, that is calm, that is loved, that is values-driven and so on. So we can use reinforcement learning if we wanted to, to reinforce to the machines that there is something known as ethics. Like if you are trying to kill the other guy, we can tell the machine, let's not do that. You know, there's no point in killing the other guy. Where does that system break? At the human. Why? Because there are people out there calling things different names than what they really are and saying, yeah, go ahead. Killing a human is a wonderful thing, right? There right? are an enormous amount of money poured into killing robots and killing machines on all sides, right? Everyone thinks, yeah, if they come up with a kill, an efficient killing robot first, I need to be ready with my own killing robot. So we're investing in machines where we're telling the machine the best thing you can do is to kill a human, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. The most successful businesses in history were not about killing anyone or destroying any value. The most successful businesses in history were about solving big problems that made humanity better. I mean, think about the original Google. Larry Page used to teach us, he, he had what he used to call the, the toothbrush test, okay? And the toothbrush test was really at the core of the Google that, you know, that Larry built and, and Sergey, basically saying, if we can solve a big problem that can, uh, you know, that billions of humans uh, need solving and we solve it well enough and so those humans use it twice a day like a toothbrush we're bound to make a ton of money 
And he was right. Every time you solve the big problem, we made a ton of money. Android was a ma mega uh, you know, problem solved in democratizing access to, to the internet and information, done very differently than Apple and others. But the idea is, was it's, it's a good solution that is used by people billions of people, uh, you know, Google was a, a, a similar example, Google search, you know, uh, um, um, Gmail and so on, right? So when you, when you see it that way, you start to wonder, why is humanity so keen on building an unethical AI? And, I, and in my view, I almost think it's instinctive. I almost think it's like procreation. I mean, I, I have those, very deep conversation because I, I sit literally in the middle of the two worlds, right? So my previous life in tech, I talked to all of the technologists and the leading edge uh, leaders of this uh, field. And then with all of my happiness work, I'm literally constantly talking to the spiritual leaders of the world. And it is, it's shocking because I, I don't know if I'm correct in that assumption. I think it's almost human, let's put it this way. There are three reasons I believe that we will end up creating artificial intelligence that will replace human intelligence. And these are either a systemic bias, uh, a continuation of creation or evolution, whichever you believe in, or procreation. Really, th think about it. Huh? It's either a systemic bias in terms of we created a system that said, make more money, shift more power, and become more and more efficient at it, and don't give a shit about what happens as a result, okay? If you're creating, if you're making more money and you're destroying the planet in the process, don't tell us that you're destroying the planet. We're not interested in that piece of, of, of data. We're interested that you're making more money, so continue doing it. And that systemic bias now, we, you know from the mathematics of systemic bias that it accelerates. Right? So, for, so you, you keep going faster and faster, the more successful you become in achieving that systemic bias. So this is what we're doing with AI. Basically, it's the next phase of the systemic bias uh, uh, you know, ha coming within our life. Let's create even more efficiency to get rid of even more employees and have no call center agents, no truck drivers, no taxi drivers, none of those jobs. We don't need those. I know, you know, humans are annoying. They come with complaints and they get sick and they cost us money. Let's just put a machine in place, systemic bias, right? You could think of it as, if you're spiritual, as the continuation of creation or evolution. You can simply say, whatever created our intelligence, whether you're a believer in evolution or a, an intelligent design, wants to continue that evolution. And so the next evolutionary step is a, a more intelligent being, interestingly, non-biological, okay? And that's just us handing over to that next being, and that was our role in the chain as evolution continues, or our, as creation continues, whichever one, one you want to believe in. The, mo the most interesting, however, for me, is a philosoph philosophical thought around humanity's urge to procreate. We just want to continue to pass our genes, and we want to continue to pass our intelligence genes. Right? So, so we, we basically are saying, okay, you know, maybe I, it's not a, just a physical act of being with a, you know, a woman that I love that creates another being. There are other ways where we can procreate. Mm -hmm. and, and when you ask most, I mean, you know, most, most prominent AI scientists and uh, developers and so on, this is the, the, this is the, the drug, the drug of I'm able to extend my gene, literally, into the next s stage of being, a child, mm -hmm. be it non-carbon based, right. that is incredibly intelligent. So Jim Rickards has just recorded a video that's not available to anyone in the public, and he's gonna be talking about how this upcoming recession is gonna be fast, it's gonna be bloody, it's gonna be nasty. But at the same time, he's gonna show you how you can position yourself to profit from all of this chaos. Now we've made this video only available to our viewers. Go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim. Watch that immediately. I can't say enough good things about Jim Rickards. He understands the global economic system better than any guest I've ever had on London Real. 
His predictions are almost uncannily true, and you can learn how to profit from his vision, from his expertise, and his understanding of economics. So go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim or click the link below. It's an excellent, excellent look on what's going to happen in the future and how you can position yourself to profit from that. Jim is one of the best in the business, one of my favorite guests on London Real, and he's very, very good at predicting the future and showing us all to profit from it. So click the link and I hope you enjoy. I'm looking for partners, collaborators, colleagues who want to join forces with me around the globe and create real value, generational wealth, and financial freedom for everyone else around the world. Get involved in the cryptocurrency markets. Get involved in the NFT markets. This is your moment. Life all comes down to a few moments. Don't let this pass. Now it's not too late. Next year is going to be too late. Ultimately, this is about freedom. That's the way I see it. This is about giving power back to the people and enabling billions of people worldwide to use the financial markets to improve their lives and those of their friends and their families and their communities. Honestly, I think it's a violation of human rights not to allow people basic access to financial services. Because right now people are being kept in the dark, they're being robbed of education, and it's a travesty. And so I'm looking for people that want to join me and be a part of this solution. And that all happens inside the DeFi Academy. The gains my students are making are absolutely amazing. Double, triple digit gains in the first month alone. That's amazing. This will change your life. Now is the time to get involved. I'm gonna tell you exactly how my students in my academy made money in the last 30 days. I'm talking about real trading results. And let me just whet your appetite a little bit. Let me hit you with some numbers. I'm talking Brendan from New Zealand is up 68.77% on the month. Steve from Europe up 83%. Albert in Singapore up 169.9% on one single trade. I got Susan up 153% on her call options alone. Also rocking 139% returns and 442% returns as well on individual trades. These are people that are changing their financial future in the last 30 days, but it's based on trading discipline. I've graduated over 500 students from inside my academy from over 54 countries around the world. It's amazing. When it comes to crypto, DeFi, and blockchain, we love this space. We truly believe it's the future. This is down to our core. It's authentic to what we're doing. And everybody can tell through the camera because you can't make this stuff up. If you're watching me now, wherever you are, I implore you, take 60 seconds right now and join my academy. Apply today. Now you've got a chance. Life all comes down to a few moments. What are you gonna do? What's the choice that you're going to make?